Thank you, Warren. We're in Luke chapter 6. Please turn. We're going to begin with verse 37. I've been uh, going to church here for many years, and um, when Doug Barrow goes to be with the Lord, uh, that's a, I'm missing, and I know you do too. Wayne Gardner uh, goes to be with the Lord. Uh, it's a sad thing to, to some degree, but also uh, a wonderful thing, uh, recognizing that the faith that they professed for all these years, and both of those men, um, has come uh, has has uh, come to fruition. The Lord has has brought them home to an, a reward and a glory that we uh, even even with the scriptures it, we can't hardly imagine. We can't imagine. So uh, that Gardner Michael um, has meant a uh, a lot to me in my life. Uh, as an encourager, as an example. Um, I know this isn't his service, so, but I, I missed his service. We were keeping our kids in, in Austin last week, but uh, uh, he, he was a gift from God, and so was Doug. So just wanted to say that. I made the comment about no excuse. What I mean is no excuse for sleeping during the lesson. <laughs> there's nothing more, so no pressure, but there's nothing more painful than to be sitting there and as hard as you try, it's Sunday morning and you're fighting it. Uh, so, and now they lose an hour of sleep, so I've got my work cut out for me. Well, uh, with our passage this morning out of Luke chapter 6, uh, beginning with verse 37, we find ourselves still in the midst of our Lord's Sermon on the Plain. That's what we've been calling it. And it's important to remember the flow of thought as we read the verses. Uh, Jesus' emphasis has been on the importance of the disciples' uh, love for others, in particular, love for one's enemies, a particularly difficult thing. It's striking how often uh, as we study God's Word and we receive instruction and we receive exhortation out of it, we're confronted with the importance of love. It, it is the, the cord, it seems, uh, we hear most often. Um, perhaps that because that is because God is love. I do think that has a lot to do with it. But the context, as we look back at verses 35 and 36, and I encourage you to, to do so, uh, is first love for one's enemies. Uh, that will identify one as a son of the Most High, for he himself is kind to such people. And then secondly, we are to be merciful as our Father in heaven is, is merciful. And so now we read of the kind of mercy expected of a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not uh, be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be uh, pardoned. Perhaps some of your versions read uh, forgive. The, the word is a common word for forgiveness, to loosen, let it go. Uh, and it can be translated pardon or forgive. So forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Uh, they will pour into your lap a good measure uh, the wardrobe of uh, the ancient times when they wore these flowing uh, garments and you could use them to, to bundle them up and make something of a pocket, uh, a bag to, to carry excess things. I'm not sure that's going to work for me, but <laughs> thank you, Cindy. <laughs> um, where, where was I? Uh, first... Um, 
38. <laughs> Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. <clears throat> and he also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Familiar verses, familiar ideas for us. Uh, this collection of verses that I've chosen for our lesson today uh, present to us this unifying thought, which we um, might generally characterize as a warning against judging other people. Uh, notice it's bookended in that way, beginning in verse 37 with do not judge and concluding with the colorful picture of the man with the log in his eye, hypocritically judging his brother who has a tiny speck in his. We're not gonna, we're not to usurp uh, the place of God in judging others. That is for him to undertake. And if we are to emulate him, it ought to be in the exercise it ought not to be in the exercise of judging, but in showing the same kind of mercy to others as he, our Father, shows mercy. In this portion of our Lord's sermon, actually throughout it, Jesus is concerned not so much with the do's and the don'ts reflected in the actions of a disciple, but with the spirit of a disciple as it radiates from within, and we might say reflects the warmth of Christ's own spirit. It's not so much external, but internal. And so it begins with this forthright command in verse 37, not to judge. Now, here we must be careful at the start. Uh, part of the accepted dogma of our modern world is that no one person has a right to judge another. If you dare to disapprove of another's conduct or beliefs, you'll be deemed to have violated the one verse in the Bible they deem worthy of consideration. Do not judge. But the Lord is not saying that we must never engage in critical thought. Uh, we know that from the context of the Bible as a whole, but especially of the New Testament. In this chapter alone, the Lord seems to be asking us to discriminate between bad teachers who are blind and good ones, uh, later between good trees and bad trees, and ultimately between those who have built their, rock, their houses on the sand and those who have built on the rock. John Stott remarked that do not judge does not mean do not think. And another of the commentators observed that there's nothing in the teaching either of Christ himself or of the apostles after him that relieves us of the obligation to form opinions about people and to act upon the basis of those opinions. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, in the same context of the Sermon on the Mount as our passage here, the Lord will insist that we not give what is holy to dogs, that we don't cast our pearls uh, before a swine. Well, in order to adhere to that, one uh, must show some discernment, some judgment of, of character. The apostles certainly made uh, judgments. Uh, Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 5, was prepared to hand over that promiscuous man uh, to Satan, uh, demanding that the local church there discipline him. But that kind of necessary uh, discipline requires 
judgment. In Galatians 1 verse 8, he pronounced anathema on any who would preach what he considered to be a different gospel than the true one. And in Philippians 3, he judged false teachers tormenting the church to be dogs. They're dogs. In each case, a judgment had to be made in order to make sense of what Paul was saying. Well, we can't cite all of the examples but, because there are many more, but lest you think, well, they were apostles. They, they had the right uh, to do that. The apostle John in 1 John 4 issued the command that his Christian friends test the spirits, test them to see whether they're from God. And in the seventh chapter of John's gospel, Jesus is quoted as, as saying, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The fact is there are different kinds of judgment. The Greek word used here allows for that breadth. And as we read our Bibles, uh, we pay attention to the context, of course, in, in, in which it is used. Here it is blind censorious judgment, the kind of critical spirit uh, that led Paul to write in another place, Romans chapter 14, to, to, to lead him to ask, why do you judge your brother or why do you regard your brother with contempt for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. It's probable, I would imagine, that many of us in this room engage in some judging. Uh, some more than others, but we all must submit our evaluations and, and criticisms to the Holy Spirit residing in us and ask Him to reveal to us the source of our judgments. For example, what is the motivation? Is there some selfish agenda within us that, that colors our opinions about others? Uh, imagining ourselves to be uh, the superior arbiter of another's conduct or behavior, or are we in fi fact being hypercritical? Or are we presumptuously self-righteous like the Pharisee with the publican in Luke chapter 18 who, remember, arrogantly prayed, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And then Jesus gave the memorable contrast of the tax collector himself, standing far away in the corner, unwilling even to lift up his eyes to God, but instead beating his breast and, and wailing, God be merciful to me, the sinner. The Pharisee was guilty of censorious uh, judgment, but he was in no position to do so. Likewise, are we even able to discern the reality of faults in others? Or must we first turn our attention to ourselves before turning it uh, to others? That is, doesn't the Lord himself explain, listen, doesn't the Lord himself explain in his own words the command not to judge in verses 41 and 42 with his illustration of the log and the speck? He answers his own question. As Stott again put it, the command not to judge is not a requirement to be blind, but rather a plea to be generous. Jesus does not tell us to cease to be human by suspending our critical powers, which help to distinguish us from mere animals, but to renounce the presumptuous ambition to be God by setting ourselves up as judges of others. But the Lord goes on in this same 37th verse to warn against condemning others. It's really the same thought, a commentary on what censorious judging really is. Only God is in a position to contemn, to condemn. It is not for a disciple of Jesus Christ to assume a posture like that. We're not condemners. But the Lord doesn't leave it at that. He, he gives concrete reasons. Here they are. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Now, that can be taken in one of two ways. 
He may have been reminding those who enjoy criticizing others that such attitudes will inevitably lead to others judging you. Uh, that is, of course, a possibility that you will be hoisted on your own uh, petard. We call that what goes around uh, comes around. Uh, most people, uh, we're all human, most people who are criticized, whether fairly or not, we tend to respond in kind and fire back. But that would be an atypical application coming from the Lord to, to use the response of others as the motivation to heed the righteous attitude that he commands. What has mattered so far in Christ's sermon, if you think about it, is God's judgment on our attitudes and behavior. To be quick to call others to account is to invite God to call us to account, a, a scary thought. And that was the caution Paul gave in that Romans 14 passage I read from. Why do you judge your brother? We'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. But this may uh, raise a red flag in the minds of some, the idea that true believers are somehow subject to God's judgment. Uh, Jesus said in John 5, 24, that the one who believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. And Paul uh, began that seminal uh, Romans uh, chapter 8 with his declaration there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And so that great verity, uh, we simply cannot challenge and we dare not dismiss it. But it's clear uh, from the scriptures that believers are not exempt from the methods our Father in heaven uses to mold us into the men and women he would have us be. They are the methods he uses to discipline us. Don't forget the author of Hebrews appeals in Hebrews chapter 12, the exhortation addressed to you as God's children. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Our heavenly father, he is the perfect critic. You, critic, you and I are not. But he is. He is the perfect critic, the errorless judge of the way we live our lives. And he exercises that judgment in order to sanctify us and to make us more like Christ. But even that discipline we're to understand is meted out in, in mercy. Uh, the theme of this section is God's mercy. Uh, we are to be merciful just as our Father is merciful. Merciful in his saving acts, merciful in his discipline. In verse 38 now, uh, Jesus takes it a step forward to advocate generous giving uh, to meet the needs of others with the assurance that such generosity will yield a divine reward. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So the image here uh, that the Lord is using is that of the grain market uh, where corn and wheat and other grains were bought and sold. That's not really the world in which most of us live. Some of you perhaps have, but most of us have not. But we understand his thought because we ourselves engage in, in buying and selling. And we know the difference between generosity and what we typically call, or I do anyway, chintziness. Uh, the, the serving of food and drink, for example, frequently elicits in us thoughts of, is that all there is? Or that's a whole lot of pasta. That's... So the image reflects one of, of extreme generosity. You can picture the measuring jar, which is well filled, not shorted, but filled to the top. And then the merchant, the generous merchant, presses the corn down so that there's room for more. And then he shakes it so that those little awkwardly shaped pieces of corn shift down and, and leave room 
uh, for more. And, and then finally more even is poured on top of that so that it overflows into the fold of one's garment like a pocket. This is how God gives to us. It's a beautiful picture of it. Uh, when we pray and we come to that time in our prayers where we want to thank God uh, for what he's uh, done for us and what he's given to us. And we find ourselves going on and on and on. And uh, pretty soon we re we, we've got to stop because we have a day ahead of us. <laughs> and God has things for us uh, to do. But we could go on and on and on. This is how uh, God uh, is with us. God is generous to us. And that is how we are to behave. That's how his disciples are to behave. We are to be generous givers. Our giving, however, not necessarily measured by its amount, but by its sacrifice. Recall the poor widow in the temple out of Mark chapter 12, unnoticed against the uh, showy display of the wealthy, ostentatiously clanging their uh, large sums of money into the treasury while she quietly put in two copper coins. And Jesus insisted that that woman had put in more than all because she had been sacrificially generous. That has so much application in our world today where people get all kinds of plaudits for gifts they've given and we know how much they're worth. It's nothing. It's nothing. They give $20 million to a hospital. I don't mean to diminish that, but it's a different thing than the two copper coins this woman threw in. In Mark chapter 10, uh, Peter, uh, per his usual self, uh, came up to Jesus and he boasted, look, we've given up everything and followed you. And Jesus replied, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus was, is uh, the ultimate giver. Uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. He was mercy uh, personified and we are to emulate him. Uh, that's indicated in, in the last clause of verse 38, which I want you to notice very carefully. This is verse 38, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. There is a rule of reciprocity that applies to one's life. Now, if in the previous section that we studied the last time together, there is a warning against the kind of reciprocal love that loves only those who love us, here we have the converse truth. If we are loving and accepting and graciously merciful, we will discover that our Lord's reciprocity is a wonderful uh, reward. It's a law not of nature, it's a law of God. And now we come to verses 39 and 40, and I must say this is one of those places in the scriptures where one wonders what the relation of it is to what has come uh, before. Does that ever happen to you? You're reading, now wait a second, <laughs> what's the shift here? Uh, verse 39, he also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil, is not above his teacher, uh, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his, his teacher. Now, a careful reader is tempted to think, as not a few of the commentators have, that here begins a new section of Jesus' sermon. And yet the verses immediately following 
and I hope you'll follow me here, the verses immediately following about the speck and the log clearly are explanatory to what we've just read. So I prefer to see in these words of our Lord a continuation of the same theme, but going in a slightly different direction. He moves from the outward behavior to the inward character of a disciple, and specifically, <clears throat> whose spirit uh, does one possess, that of the scribes and the Pharisees or of the master? Well, the blind leading uh, the blind is proverbial. It is today, and it was in Jesus' time. If they're both blind, uh, the result will be disastrous. It goes without saying. Uh, the Lord's disciples, no doubt, uh, wearied of him applying that to them. But from the Lord's perspective, the religious leaders of the day were afflicted with blindness. Uh, they were blind guides, he said more than once. So there is a warning here, certainly to be careful whom we choose to follow, but it is also a warning to the disciples that they have their own blindness to contend with. If they lack love and are possessed by a judgmental spirit, then they'll be able to un unable to see clearly and lead others, to be teachers of others. Like with the Pharisees, they will all together fall into this pit of disaster. That's what your life is going to be like, he's telling them if you continue down this path that needs correction. And then he personalizes it in uh, verse 40, continuing the theme. A pupil, a, a disciple, is not above his teacher. Uh, th this was a period in history where there wasn't an abundance, an abundance of books. There weren't libraries to go to. There, were, there weren't websites. Uh, many of you know, well, Mark, you were telling me about the Logos uh, website. None of that. Did you know none of that existed uh, back then? And a learner was completely dependent upon his teacher, upon his rabbi. The disciples must not behave differently than Jesus himself. Jesus was accepting, uh, condemning of sin, certainly, but never of the sinner. He didn't delight in exposing the shortcomings of others, but he lovingly espoused a, a change of course. So only when they became fully trained in that way could his disciples be like him, uh, their teacher. And that normally takes uh, some time. We wish we could rush it. We wish we could make it come faster, but it takes some time. That verb translated fully trained was used of mending broken things, of mending nets, uh, that can be tedious work, and, and it will not do to, to rush it. it. It takes time to patch up our torn attitudes and behaviors and bring them into conformity with the mature and faithful uh, teacher. But the main idea in these two verses, I think, is that uh, here are these disciples, and by definition, Jesus is teaching and training them to rise up and teach others, and they still have a long way to go. Uh, they need glasses. <laughs> they need laser surgery, uh, the kind of treatments that by treating the eyes repairs the heart before they reach the stage of completion Christ has in mind for them. Only then will they reach that stage where faced with danger and threats all around their enemies as with Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. Remember in Acts chapter 4, only then will their enemies observe them and recognize those people have been with Jesus. And now in verses 41 and 42, the Lord, as he often did, reinforces his lesson with a brilliant illustration it's one we're all familiar with, and also one, the more you ponder it, the more humorous it becomes. Uh, the New American Standard Version translates these two Greek words as the speck and the log. Uh, you may prefer, at least one person in here may prefer the old King James translation of the moat and the beam. I don't know about moat, but I do like beam. 
uh, moat is meaningful to us only because we're familiar with that old uh, translation. But the word, it's karphos, refers to any tiny object that has been dislodged from a larger object. So it's variously translated as a speck or a splinter that has somehow infiltrated the eye of a person's brother. And it is contrasted with this log or a beam that Jesus observes is in the person's own eye. And the Lord wants to know, simple question, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Now, I taught the parallel passage out of the Sermon on the Mount several years ago out of Matthew, and at the time uh, we were doing some remodeling in our, our, our kitchen. So I illustrated it at the time uh, out of a construction uh, scene in cases where you're adding more space to an existing space. It's often required that you bridge the old with the new, and so there needs to be added structural reinforcement. So the builders will bring in these a giant beam or giant beams of compressed wood to bridge the old with the new and provide stability. And when they're installed, they're so big and heavy, sometimes you have to bring a crane in or at least have four or five strong uh, men in order to lift it into place. And so it helps me when I read the Lord's illustration uh, to picture it in this way. A speck of sawdust, you can see it in the shafts of light, a speck of sawdust has drifted into the eye of a person at this uh, work site. And over time, it's going to be problematic but in the other fellow, uh, one of these giant beams has slipped and uh, tragically and in a comically ludicrous way jammed itself into uh, his eye, which unfortunate uh, situation needs the most attention. Well, in Jesus' illustration, in the opinion of the man with the beam in his eye, it's the other, the man with the splinter who is in dire need of repair. <laughs> And this is the point of the story, uh, this misguided fixation on others. Not on who you see in the mirror, but on others. And quoting from another one of the commentators, the fatal tendency to exaggerate the fault of others and minimize the gravity of our own. And one has taken it upon himself to remedy the situation with the other but he's in no position to make a clear judgment. He's disqualified from the bench. Not only is he disqualified, he's unable to come to his aid. That's because sin blinds us. Uh, that's the Lord's point in the 42nd uh, verse. Or how can you say to your brother, uh, let me take <clears throat> the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. It's a problem of vision or, or sight of what one is looking at. A.T. Robertson, <clears throat> the Greek scholar whose famous word pictures in the New Testament has been a constant source of insight into the study of those scriptures, took note of the different Greek words Jesus used in these verses to represent the act of seeing. And the first is blepo in, in verse uh, 41, translated look. It's the most basic idea of catching sight of something. Uh, we, we read it. Why do you look? Well, look there. He, he, he caught sight of it. But the next is the word translated notice. Notice in my version, you do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Kata no eo. That is a more intense form of looking to which, in which one observes something carefully and, and takes time to consider it. And the Lord wants to know why, why after merely catching sight of the speck in a brother's eye, he doesn't stop and take careful examination of the bigger problem that is in his own eye. 
And then the final third word for looking is at the end of verse 42, the intensive form of the first verb, diablepo, meaning to not just see, but see clearly. Then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Take care, in other words, of that log in your own eye, and then you'll really be able uh, to view the speck in your brother's eye with wide open eyes yourself. Why is that so often a new revelation to us? The answer is human nature, sinful human nature. We live with this risk to our own perception. Uh, there is no shortcoming too small in others uh, to absorb our attention and distract us from what is the more urgent need. The danger for us when we judge others is that there is a much more significant issue we are refusing to confront and it resides in us. What we find wrong in a brother becomes a very small thing compared to the sin God sees in us. That doesn't mean necessarily that we are somehow a worse uh, sinner than the person who has caught our, eye, caught our eye after all. And this is really part of the beauty of Christ's illustration. What may appear is only a speck in another's eye when it is lodged in your own, it's transformed into the beam that must first be removed. And only then is one enabled, as Jesus says, to see clearly, to take the speck out of one's brother's eye. Well, I want to make uh, one quick <clears throat> last illustration, uh, application of this illustration. It's the last clause. Then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. It's an understated application, but our own sin does not alleviate the responsibility of members of the body of Christ to one another. In another place, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus will go on to address uh, what one of his disciples should do, should do when another brother uh, sins. Here in the Sermon on the Plain, he calls for the priority of self-criticism before turning to his brother. But in Matthew 18, he positively directs us to go and show the brother his fault in private. If he listens to you, Jesus says, you've won your brother. And there's more we could say about that, but as we often emphasize, uh, we don't live our lives here as members of the body of Christ in a silo, uh, in silos, unattached to one another. No, we're tied uh, to one another and the responsibilities we have before the head of our church when they're fulfilled uh, benefit uh, the body as a whole, benefit all of us. Well, I'm going to finish on time. All these exhortations of the Lord has, that the Lord has given us in this sermon uh, are, are tied together. Uh, the blessing upon the poor in spirit and upon those who suffer in this life on account of their testimony for Christ the willingness to suffer under injustice and even return love to one's enemies instead of vengeance, uh, the command to show mercy as our Heavenly Father shows mercy, and now the warning against judging others. Humility. Humility covers, colors them all. Uh, the quipster says, I love humility, especially when I see it in myself, but that's really so very true. Uh, we tend to be so selfishly blind to our own shortcomings and so maliciously and hypocritically judgmental of others, and we are willing to ignore our own failures. An episode in the life of the great King David perhaps illustrates it best after his great sin of first adultery with Bathsheba and then the murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. David seemed to recover and forge ahead with little remorse, it seemed like, reading the, the passage until Nathan the prophet paid him that, that visit. He told David a sad tale 
of how a rich man with many livestock had taken a poor neighbor's uh, only little uh, ewe lamb, which had become his beloved pet, and he had it slaughtered in order to feed some unexpected traveler who had come his way. And David was enraged. You know this story. In a, in a fury, he condemned the rich man to death. Surely he must die, not realizing that in condemning him, he was in fact passing sentence on himself. Whatever humility David had once possessed had fled in the hidden recrimination of his soul. He was blind to his own condition even as he was enraged at the sin in another, the same sin. It's what the sin of censorious judgmentalism will, will do to us. It will blind us and distort God's justice. It will erode our consciences and it will rob our Heavenly Father of his own reputation for mercy by distorting his image uh, before those we come into contact with. So may God protect us from such a spirit and may he fill us with the spirit of the Lord Jesus who left behind the divine rights he had so that he might take the justice we are due upon himself. He is our merciful God and Savior. Let's give thanks to him. Lord, we come to you in his name, uh, your son, our Savior, uh, the epitome of mercy, the epitome of humility uh, in that great humiliation of emptying himself. And Father, uh, we confess our judgment is inaccurate and, and insufficient and faulty, and uh, yours is perfect. And so, Lord, we thank you for the mercy that you show to us as you evaluate us. And we thank you for the patience that you uh, show with us as we continually uh, disappoint and fall short of uh, your standards. Uh, but most of all, we thank you for the forgiveness that is ours because of our great and merciful Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.